appreciation of the tremendously increasing importance of religion in the life of the average citizen, that maybe we should look back a little to some of the things that were happening about 2,000 years ago. If you will remember from the concordances and so forth, that by the middle of the first century, nearly all of the original disciples had passed on. Of the twelve, eleven were martyred. The twelfth, John, retired to the Isle of Patmos, where he worked some think upon the fourth gospel and others upon the book of the Revelation. Out of that original group, there was no one of the original group that survived to carry on the work. Also, if we study the various records of the Acts of the Apostles and so forth, we find out that Christianity was then a series of little isolated congregations living in a world that did not understand and could hardly tolerate them, and in many cases perse persecuted them outrageously. The church as we know it does not exist in this pattern. There was no Christianity at that time. There was a message, and all of the messengers had vanished. Now apparently there was not among these messengers any essential glimpse of a worldwide message. Most of the little communities that did exist were in the area where the older beliefs were still well entrenched. And as a result, they were simply a sect or a division or a minor revolution or a reform in the existing patterns. There was no real concept of a great mission, a great individual surviving revelation. And then for some reason something happened that was very difficult to understand from the Bible records. A person by the name of Saul came along, and he persecuted the Christians thoroughly and mercilessly. He was basically, however, apparently, a perfectly sincere individual who believed that the religion he had was the one to be protected. Saul had another and one or two other interesting specialties. One peculiarity of Paul that made him strangely useful was that he was a citizen of Rome. He was born in Tarsus, and when the Romans settled down in front of Tarsus to take the city, instead of a bloody war, the elders of Tarsus went out and voluntarily said, let us keep the peace, you can have the city, let us not kill people. And the Romans were so delightful in this respect and so happy to have this happen that they proclaimed all of the citizens of Tarsus as citizens of Rome. Now this was not an empty title. It carried with it great privileges, privileges of travel, uh, privileges of protection by the various departments of the Roman government. It made it illegal uh, to imprison a Roman citizen without a trial and without proper legal following. Also, a Roman citizen could not be crucified, hanged, or in any other way tortured. If it was a major crime and he had to die, he had to be decapitated. No torturing was permitted of a Roman citizen. Now, uh, Paul had this peculiar something. And it was possibly this, that peculiarity that changed his name from Saul to Paul. As Paul, he was now a Latin citizen. He was also a man of good family, and he was an educated man. He is known to have spoken Latin, and he probably had some knowledge of Greek, if we are to remember his sermon uh, in Athens. So uh, Paul was a man with various accomplishments, but with a deadly prejudice. Yet here was an emergency, 
And in an emergency, heaven very often makes a pronouncement on its own. It was not at all likely that the little community at that time of Christians would have voluntarily selected Saul to become their spokesman. But on the road to Damascus, a mystery occurred. As he was riding toward Damascus to persecute the Christians, Paul was suddenly struck with a mysterious vision. A tremendous experience occurred to him. There was a great turmoil in his own heart. An incredible, miraculous occurrence. And in the midst of this occurrence came the words, Why persecutest thou me? Paul didn't see Christ. He only heard the words. But he was thrown from his horse, fell on the ground in a state of almost suspended animation, and stricken blind. Well... When he was in this condition, he was carried into Damascus and was treated and restored to health by the little Christian community that he had come to persecute. This was the re resulted in the tremendous conversion of Paul. He now presented to the world a person tremendously and devoutly moved by an experience which happened to himself. <clears throat> he was not uh, converted by any ordinary means. He was converted by an act of the divine will. And in this state, apparently, it was his duty and his moral obligation to change his point of view and serve the cause he had attempted to destroy. And Paul did exactly this. And he became one of the most important spokesmen of the new Christian community. In fact, he was really the source of a Christian community. He suddenly picked a local faith out of the mystery and sand and dust of the Near East and laid the foundations of a worldwide religion that was to endure to this time and is still having a tremendous effect upon the cultural life and religious hopes of mankind. So Paul became the leader of a branch of the early revelation. And we find Christianity dividing very early into two great schools, one of them being the Jerusalem school and the other being the Greek school. The Greek school was led by Paul. The Jerusalem school was led by Peter. And in Rome, Peter and Paul died side by side for the faith that they had served. Peter crucified because he was not a citizen of Rome. And Paul decapitated. But the foundation was laid of two schools of Christian thought. One founded largely upon the Old Testament and the other founded upon something else, probably Paul's knowledge of Greek and Latin culture. In other words, Peter was working with Jesus, and Paul had visualized Christ. And it was the Jesus of Peter and the Christ of Paul that became the two great forces in the development of Christianity. The Christianity of Peter was very conservative. It was very literal. It was a friend that was being honored. Peter knew Jesus. The disciples all knew him and were deeply personally involved in the story of the man, the life of the man, the things they had seen him do, the wonders he had wrought, the teachings he had given, and the final martyrdom which he experienced. Add to this the mystery of the resurrection, and the disciples of Jesus were a small group who loved him, knew him, and in a mysterious way thought of the religion mostly in terms of him, and in terms of him as a person walking with them on the dusty roads of Judea. Paul, as far as we can find out, never saw Jesus. 
He never met him. He did not know him personally. Therefore, there was a different point of view here. Uh, Peter was thinking constantly of the man that walked with him. Paul was thinking of something else. Paul was in the position to lay the foundations of a great religion because while he was converted completely, he was not bound to the personality of the teacher. And in this particular case, this was very significant. So we find Paul gradually building the foundations of what we might term mystic Christianity. Now the question has been raised as to the source of the thinking which influenced Paul's mind in connection with the church. If we read the Corinthians and Thessalonians, we realize almost immediately that we are dealing with a person who had a knowledge, understanding, and an insight outside of the area of conservative theology. He was a man who had worldly, wise, and experienced, and now suddenly, deeply, profoundly dedicated. As obvious, the obvious facts remain that the, the mysticism of Paul began to change the shape of the Christian faith. There was to be, of course, the Jesus of Peter, but the Christ of Paul was not a person. The Christ was an eternal principle, a divine power. It was not a person. A person could have that power, but the power was not the person. The divine principle of infinite love was far beyond the control of any individual. And Paul was reaching out to the experience of the love of Christ rather than of the his physical, historical, biographical setting of the faith. It was gradually aware, Paul was aware probably in his own time, for we are aware of the same thing now, that there's a great deal of difference between a nominal worshiper and a true Christian. There is a great deal of difference between a person being baptized and that same person being consecrated. There are, these are not the same things, although they have come to be considered as such. We have long and many times regarded a person as belonging to a faith simply because he was born into it, or because he accepted it, or because he was baptized. These things to Peter were the very important parts of the doctrine and they have descended down to us today in Syrian Christianity. But to Paul these things were not so important. And I remember one afternoon I spent several hours with a group of retired clergymen who were living in retirement in, their, of the, in the home set aside by their sect for their habitation in their closing years. Each one of these men had been a missionary or a preacher in the field. Some were very well educated. Some were very dimly educated. Some were considerably younger in spirit than others. But each one in his own way went into the story of his career and his ministry. And of course the great pride was the number of persons they had converted. So there was a little competition among these uh, ministers, retired ministers, as to which one of them had converted the most. And each was very proud of the fact that he had brought hundreds to God. And this was the real reason for his life of happiness and his sense of satisfaction which would carry him to the end of his days. On the other hand, there were certain doubts about this matter. Some of these uh, ministers admitted frankly that conversion was not as satisfactory as it, might, as it might be. In other words, if you really wanted to set up a pattern of capturing relaxed, relapsed sinners and bring them back to the faith, you had to do something much more than convert them. And the only thing that most of these ministers could do was reconvert them. So every year the minister went through and picked up those who had fallen by the way and converted them again and the majority of converts had to be saved at least once a year, or they wouldn't make it. Now this was the point 
that uh, Paul obviously noticed, possibly in the very small communities of early Christians, that there were many in these communities who were devout, but uh, had very little evidence of insight or understanding. They believed, but they lived exactly as they would have lived if they hadn't believed. They accepted the responsibility, perhaps were willing to face martyrdom, but in their daily transactions of life, the Spirit of Christ was not present. It was something that was far away and was miraculously conjured into existence by the rites, rituals, and ceremonies of the church. Paul recognized this point, namely that uh, according to Greek philosophy, he was obviously well straight trained in Platonism and also probably in Alexandrian metaphysics on this mysticism or hermetic philosophy. These things come through his writings and if we want to say, well, that's just not possible, let us remember that the apocalypse of John is also definitely of pagan origin. And for this reason, Martin Luther did not want it to be included in the Bible. But John obviously had contact with secret organizations and mystical sects in the area. And this seems also to have been true of Paul, that he had certain contacts. We know that he was, uh, to some degree, an initiate of some rites, because he describes the, the circumstances to us. He may have been a Dionysian artificer, or a, an Essene, because he says, I am a wise master builder, a term which has always been associated with some of these astro, uh, esoteric orders. Regardless of whether he had a formal membership or not, he had a knowledge. And his knowledge led him directly into Christian mysticism. And this led again into the foundation of a world religion. The mysticism of Paul was based upon one very basic and essential point. The Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now this is something that while we hear much about it in the Testaments today, we see very little evidence of contemplating the mystery of it. That we are no longer speaking of the Jesus of the roads to, to Jerusalem. We are no longer speaking about the Christ in heaven as the Son of God. We are speaking about something else. The Christ in ourselves. And that the power of the creative trinity by which we are brought into existence, the power of God in us comes in the form of a Trinitarian in invocation, a mystery of three in one, in which the power of the Godhead as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit become, this Godhead becomes part of each of us when we are born that we are actually the, the living temples of a living God. We are ourselves the keeper of the Christianity that we claim to believe. We are in our own person and in our own flesh, serving or not serving. This has nothing to do really with our attendance at the church. This may be good. It may help us in time of stress. And the insight that we seek would not prevent us from going to church, but it would move Christianity from the church to our own hearts, where it belongs. And it would make the church no substitute for the good life. It would not permit an individual through either confirmation or ordination to feel that there was any way he could escape the duties of daily life. Now, we see today a, bil a billion Christians, perhaps a little more, is the world's largest singular religion. And yet, among these billion people, we have several nations at war at the present time. We have leaders all claiming some form of religious affiliation who are not living the creeds that they claim to belong to. We know, for instance, that this is not only true of Christianity, but of other religions. Wherever there is a religion, wherever there is a religion, there is a nominal membership and an active membership. A nominal membership hopes for the best, 
and places all faith upon a membership or an acceptance or an acknowledgement. This is the point that Paul was very definitely attempting to attack. It was not the fact that we become a nominal believer that does us any particular good. It is only the degree to which this believing changes conduct, changes our way of life, corrects the infirmities of the soul and, and the body, and gives us a new sense of significance in life, that each one of us, in a way, is a, tr a church, and the humanity together is the great congregation. The Christ in us is therefore a spirit in us that may be under various names. The same spirit that we call Christ may be called Buddha by somebody else or might be called Muhammad. We not say what these people or these beings can be called, but regardless of what they are named, it is their works by means of which we prove our membership. It is only when we keep the rules, keep the laws, and keep the peace that we are fulfilling any form of religious uh, acceptability, anything that will give us the right to consider that we are bound in the right direction. So we all come down now to the 20th century where the house of Paul has become very largely Protestant Christianity. That of Peter is the Eastern Church or the Roman or Greek Christianity. These two great sections or great schisms are essentially worshipping the same thing. They are using the same words and the same names. But one worships as an act of faith and the other worships as a personal character and a dedicated daily existence. So that uh, very largely now we think of true Christianity much in the way that Paul has given it to us, namely that it is a way of life and that it basically makes little difference whether we've ever been confirmed or not. We can be a Christian without a church, but there can never be a real church without Christians. So we have a tremendous challenge the challenge of inventorying our own way of life. We go down some sort of trail, we accept the gospel, declare ourselves converted, and then what do we do? We probably go home and go to a picket in the afternoon or sit down in front of our favorite television program, and after a little while wish we could turn it off and haven't got the strength to do so. <laughs> Actually, also we still have that feud with the neighbor, we still have trouble getting along with our relatives. We are also involved in business transactions that might be a bit shady. And there are very many cases in which uh, uh, famous gangsters have been buried with the full uh, ritual of their faith. There's been no recognition of the fact that faith has to change people. That Christianity is a changing of an individual for the better. It is not simply something he says, I'm a Christian, looks around and goes on and does what he intended to do in the first place. Also, it is true that when they gather together, only those really belong in whom the light of Christianity is very obvious and evident in daily conduct. I have known a few persons who I believe were really very good Christians in the best sense of the word. One of them had originally been an atheist, same as Paul, perhaps, with a little different twist. But he had never had any particular religion in his life, but he came into the presence of a tragedy in the life of a friend and was suddenly converted to the important fact that human beings are living, living in this world to help each other, not to help themselves off of what other people have. He suddenly realized that the only useful thing that a person can do is serve. So he became a very good servant of other people in need and in trouble. And gradually his material fortunes, I guess, declined a little. But his number of sincere friends and those ready to serve him and serve with him increased every day. 
He had a long life and a happy one simply because he tried to live every day as religion would have inspired him to live. He believed in trying hard to be useful. He did not pray for wealth. He did not pray for happiness. He prayed for the privilege of being useful. And he did it all in the name of God because he said it was the God in him that had to do the work. So we find people who heal that way. We find people who teach that way. Some of them never join any church, but because the church is in them, they are good Christians or good Buddhists or good Muslims, whatever it may be. Then we find this great fringe of people to whom the religion is something of dignity, uh, something to be respected, even to be admired, but not to be applied in personal daily living because it interfered with the fulfillment of selfish interests, attitudes, and appetites. We are suffering today in Christendom, in Christendom from about as much moral dishonesty as has ever plagued this world at one time. We are constantly aware of the situation around us in which people we have trusted have deceived us, people we have worked with have variously exploited us, and those who have been given places of responsibility have abused them. We see all this. And yet a great part of it is taking place within what would be called nominally a Christian world. Most of these people, if put to the test, would insist that they are Christians. But it has never enabled them to rise above the various problems of personal living. We know this because we have them come here all the time and ask my assistance in various ways. They're in all kinds of trouble. They admit they're in trouble. They admit they did wrong. But it never seemingly goes deeply enough for them to perform the miracle of revelation within themselves. They do not seem to have the courage to apply the principles of life to the daily living uh, community responsibilities. So we could say, as Paul would have put it, that it was time for us to call upon internal resources. And that would end another problem that is very discouraging, and that is the constant clash of creeds. People who belong to one sect do not even speak to members of other sects. They don't acknowledge any point of view but their own. Whereas if all of these people were living from within themselves, there could be no competition of this kind. They would live according to their own ideal of what was right. And the resulting happiness, the resulting peace of mind, the resulting security arising from living up to your, your belief would be far more important than trying to live down to a better belief and never getting there. Actually, therefore, uh, the move of religion out of the churches primarily the churches can definitely secure certain values. In fact, the churches constitute places of union or reunion of people with, with sincere beliefs. But we take religion out of institutions and put it into individuals where it belongs. So we can take the Ten Commandments and look them over. We can take the commandments of Christ and look them over. Or the wise statements of Paul and look them over. And we know that all of these teachers advocated peace, that we should live with our brothers in harmony and in concord. And yet the Christian world is not at peace. It has probably been never less peaceful. All over the world, individuals attending similar churches are at each other's throats. Why? Because the actual religion which they preach is not in themselves. It's in a book or in a creed or on an altar, but it is not in them. So we think it's very important at this time, in Easter particularly, to give a, an additional thought to this Christ in us, which is the hope of glory, and that we should try to find some way to lift the level of our own thinking and living. Now, to some people, this might be a difficult thing to do. 
And of course, most of the, the Bible tells us the more worldly goods we have and the more worldly position we occupy, the more difficult it is to live a good life. Temptations become too numerous, the pressure of ulterior motives too strong. But we have here young people growing up on narcotics. These people, they come from Christian families. And some of these narcotic sufferers actually go to church. I've known them. But they don't have the courage or the strength to break the habit that is breaking them. So everywhere we find some beautiful thoughts. And today all over Christendom there will be great rejoicing and the privilege of living in a Christian world. Therefore let us try to make this not only a privilege but a responsibility. Let us try not to ruin this Christian world by our own personal uh, misrepresentations uh, of facts and realities. After all, there is no reason why intelligent people, dedicated people, and responsible people should not be able to mingle in gentle communion of hope and purpose. There is too much of certain internal things that come in way. Religion is an internal thing. And one way we may have to approach it in life is through a psychological study. We know that people with poor dispositions are sick. We know that an individual who nurses a grudge long enough will become a personification of that grudge. We know that individuals who do not correct certain mistakes that they make, shorten their lives, increase the problems of sickness, and also destroy the lives of their families. We know selfish parents who try to dominate their children far too long. We notice selfish children who grow up and neglect the parents. We know some that go out and take a job and neglect their children. Everywhere something is happening that isn't good, solid Christianity. Now this doesn't mean that, the, that Christianity is a slave driver. Christianity is meaningless unless it makes you happy. If, it's, if it doesn't make you happy as a person serving with others for the common good, then there's something wrong with your standard of happiness. The Christianity is not a slave driver. It is not a merciless dictator. And various churches of different periods and times that have tried to usurp control over the temporal life of everything have all gone down because it was not reasonable or correct. But there is a definite need right now in this time when we are talking about reorganizing society to get at some of the facts. We've simply recently had quite a bad expose of television clergymen. Uh, we find that the truth, the principle, the spirit has been neglected in order to justify unreasonable profits. So that instead of serving God, we are mostly serving mammon, as we were warned in the Old Testament, might happen. We have, therefore, every reason to say that it's time to really give a little thought to the real life that we are supposed to live. One thing that might help a lot of people in this particular problem would be if they had a little niche or a little corner somewhere even in a single room apartment where there was some little sense of sacredness. A little sacred picture, an image, a, a sacred book, a display of some sacred object, and a regular period of consecration and concentration in which the individual communes inwardly upon the meaning of the symbols which he has assembled. In religion, symbolism is the open door to communion. It is the way in which the individual gradually becomes aware of the beauty and wisdom of life. Symbolism, therefore, opens the door to the understanding heart. And as the mind and the emotions and the body come into tune with reality, then they find, they find that divine power that is within us can flow forth. We are all endowed with life. If we were not, we couldn't breathe, we couldn't live, we couldn't do anything. 
And yet this life that we are living with and from and by is not simply something that is on a meter somewhere created by water going over a dam. This life in us is a part of the universal reality. It is infinite life. It is life in all things. And regardless of what it is, from the most noble and heroic soul to the least insect, bird, creeping thing, all life is one. All life is one infinite resource manifesting through an infinitude of branches and manifestations. And this life that is in us is essentially sacred. It is not secular. When we destroy life of any kind, needlessly and thoughtlessly, we are only damaging one life. There is only one. And this one life in us not only provides us with the means of getting around, doing our daily jobs and things of this nature, but also gives us the opportunity for introspection, for the internal investigation of ourselves, a constant watching of that which we do and what we say. It isn't a neighbor prying on our privacies. It is ourselves looking into our own innards to find out what private vices we are carefully concealing under the general heading of the good Christian life and existence. I think one of the, point, the points we have to face is that we must all finally prove that we are potential Christs. Sometime in the great farness of things, sometime beyond the recognition that we now know, the godness in ourselves will come of age. Somewhere along the line, there is the time when that is that divinity which is locked within us will no longer be held behind a stern misuse of resources, but will come forth. That which comes forth from within is good. That with which we struggle on the outside can very often be very bad. One thing is certain, however, someday we are going to be converted as Paul was, by a vision, by a tremendous personal experience of some kind. And without that personal experience, the true mystery of religion is seldom fulfilled. Now, this great experience may not be anything as stupendous or unbelievable as the vision of, that came to Paul. But there is something in our own lives that comes along that we suddenly realize that religion is the only real and living answer. Something tells us where the solution is to a problem. I know we've read many letters from people who live alone, lonely people of advanced years, who have no, no friends or relatives that are close, but live in a sort of community charity, even though they may have enough money to live independently as long as they live. These people have within themselves very little they are sometimes badly mistaken in their allegiances. They become neurotic. They uh, lose all contact with human life. They retire into themselves in a kind of a haze of despondency. These people have never realized or do not realize that infinite life is just as much in them as it is in the sun, moon, and stars. The infinite power, as long as we breathe, bestows upon us the privilege of doing things, of continuing valuable labors, of subscribing to the assistance of others, to improvement of our own natures, and to the gradual conquest of the negative attitudes that plague ourselves. All these things are part of a good Christian life. And on this uh, day of, of Easter, this uh, resurrection morn, uh, many people feel that the resurrection of Christ had to be symbolical because it was just not possible for a dead person to rise physically from his own grave. But uh, if you read it right, it is possible because we are all dead persons. We're walking around mostly in a state of half-existence. And yet when we begin to realize the values of life, 
There is a resurrection in ourselves. Many have risen from the deadness of materialism to the liveness of understanding and insight. Each of us is capable of a resurrection, a resurrection and restoration of that which is best, noblest, and proper for a human being to cultivate. So if we are actually not only children of God, but personifications and embodiments of deity, then there are responsibilities that come to us. It is no longer the communion cup or the sanctified wafer. It is the individual himself as the living vessel, the living symbol of this great confirmation of spiritual reality. Each individual taking the journey from here to there. Taking, making the journey as found in Neoplatonism, with which apparently Paul was well informed, uh, the plate Neoplatonism that tells us that we are all on one great journey, and that that journey is the great journey home. We are all exiles somewhere. We are all living on the circumference of a life. But, but one by one, we move gradually toward the center, toward the th point from which we came in the beginning. We become journeyers in the valley of the shadow, but we are going home. We are going home not to uh, idleness, not to uh, be uh, ca carried away on flowery beds of ease or something of that kind. We are going home to the full appreciation and understanding of our own natures. We are going home to the realization that each of us has a divine power within him, which can be used to improve the rest of himself and can become a major factor in the improvement of society. There is a legislation all the time, now probably more and more, of what to do about schooling, what to do about politics, what to do about stocks and bonds, all solved without any consideration for the reality of life. Behind every stockbroker and every school teacher and every pupil, there is this unit of divine energy that makes them alive. Without this energy, there'd be no stockbrokers, there'd be no teachers, there'd be no broken homes because there would be nothing. It is the fact that within each of us there is something that is big enough to solve our problem that becomes a tremendous realization. It makes us suddenly realize that we can achieve in the terms of truth that which is necessary to make us useful instruments of a divine purpose. We will not start thinking on how good we are or how wonderful we are, but rather to realize that we are all channels of the one good which never changes, the one reality that can never die and the one code of law that can never be broken. And when we begin to realize this, we see ourselves as children of one great family. We see ourselves as the body of deity, and as the Essenes and the, also the Gnostics pointed out, if you put all the souls in the world together in one place, the answer is they are God. For everything that is separate is part of that which is indivisible in substance and divisible only in appearances. So here now with another Eastic with us and another restatement of our belief in the reality and purpose of the divine missionary, we could perhaps find it a profitable thought to see what we can do in this year to open the door to the best of ourselves that is locked within, that we can gradually become so worthy of a better life that it cannot be kept from us, that we will get what we deserve, and that has been our trouble. We've been getting what we deserve, and the time has come to try to deserve something better. So we can start, and I don't think anyone will have a hard time finding something to work on, because most people have few little errors here and there, that will not take a monumental effort, but which will require a little personal thought necessary, or whether we are a part of a program of exploitation, which is nearly really not just. If we are merchandise, merchandising, are we giving fair weights? 
If we are employers, do we give fair wages? Are we trying constantly for physical profit, or do we realize that physical profit is going to vanish, no matter how hard we labor to get it, and that there's only one kind of progress that is real, and that is moral ethical progress. There is no other kind. Every other form of progress is a deceiver, and every kind of wealth that is not a virtue is a vice and a danger. So we go around trying to collect money, and the time comes we lie down and leave it for our heirs to squander, or some government to take away from us in inheritance taxes. We work so hard for these things that really bring us no pleasure. We have a certain sense of bigness, certain sense of strength as a result of all these little chicaneries which we are addicted to. But this is not the real solid facts of life. This isn't the thing we're all trying to work for. It isn't how much, we can, much money we can get in the bank. It is how much of the inner resource of ourselves can we call upon when need arises. Are we in peace with that power within ourselves, which must be the source of wisdom, of happiness, and of health? If we are not at peace with that inner power, we're going to have trouble in our daily life, and we are going to find that we are creating difficult situations which we may not want to face. So we find Paul's doctrine going around the world in the Christian habit of things. We are seeing his message, love one another, and the, be, let these three stand, hope, faith, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So to uh, Paul, Christ was love. Now love today is a word that is practically meaningless. The dictionary hardly knows how to handle it. But love in the sense, in the essential sense that Paul means love to be, is like the love of Damon and Pythias. A greater love than this hath no man, than that he will lay down his life for his friend. So we have always, in this problem of divine love, we find the remedy for human selfishness. We find the remedy for all these little hurts and cuts and insults that make life difficult. Someone says something nasty, we have to say something nasty back. And very soon, all of the peace and joy of life has been fractured by some meaningless, worthless incident. We have to find some way, therefore, if we want Christianity to rise and become the common religion of Western man at least, that we have a forgiveness in ourselves. We have a probably two or three hundred sects of Christianity today. Some of them are not on any speaking terms with each other. Many of them are in highly competitive relationships. Most of them are very much interested in the ach achieving a physical splendor. They want to be dominant in membership or in the beauty of edifice or uh, glory of uh, the preaching that they do. This is all wrong because actually there is only one church. And as one writer has said, that, that church, the spans and arches of it, are the clasped hands of comrades. It is only in the living of a faith that we build its final cathedral. For the great church of a religion is the living members of it. These are the cedars of Lebanon referred to in the building of Solomon's temple. We are living trees that become pillars in the house of our God. And at the same time that we do this, we are gradually building a world in which no longer will we be worried by the names of people or by the names of gods or by the names of angels or of spirits or of demons. We will know only that all these different things are names for one thing, and that is eternal life and eternal and everlasting manifestation. If we can realize this, we can live in harmony with life. We can live in harmony with the world instead of in constant competition. We're gradually now beginning to realize this. And little by little, new thoughts are coming in. 
more and more we are now seeking an internal satisfaction, not in the selfish sense, but in the sense of peace. In this world that we are having today, peace has become almost unknown. Problems are constant, incessant, and continuing. But peace is available, and that peace lies within the person themselves, lies within the ability of the individual to solve the, the uproars and confusions and conflicts which have possessed him for so long. So on Easter Day, let's try to find the resurrection of love in ourselves. Let us try to find something where, where we haven't been so loving, and in the name of an eternal principle, correct a common human defect. If we have somebody we haven't spoken to, let's speak to them. If we have someone we have a grudge against, let's solve it. If we have an idea of making money dishonestly, let's stop it. If we are tempted to compromise our integrities and our moralities, let's pause and reconsider. And if we are on narcotics or something of that, or alcohol, let us remember that we are in that way locking ourselves out of the world of our own internal spiritual resources. Something good in ourselves is languishing while we nurse some human frailty to excess. There's no need for this. So uh, that, for Easter, let's not think merely of the, a resurrection 2,000 years ago, but a continuing resurrection throughout the ages. Nations rising from their own ashes. Nations, peoples, cities, communities, lives, coming out of darkness into light as a result of gentle, thoughtful, kindly consideration of the needs of the world. We have never been a time when the world needed as much as it needs now. But it certainly doesn't need nuclear weapons. It certainly doesn't need any of these destructive things. And how these destructive things can belong to people. In the midst of these people rises the church with the statement, love one another. And we, these people go daily or weekly to a church where they believe and hear the words of peace, love one another, and the kindness and the gentleness and the cooperation and the beauty. And then they go right out and start fighting again. This is the thing that has to change. And it cannot be changed by law. You cannot legislate religion. You can legislate theology. You can say you won't permit it in your country, or you will not have a country without it. But you cannot legislate the spiritual life of the individual. You cannot tell him that if he doesn't behave himself, he will go to the perdition. That thought has been worn out. It doesn't mean anything anymore. There's no reason for the average... One, one young man told me, by the way, the other day, that his parents were always afraid of hell. But he really wasn't afraid anymore. Because whatever it is, it couldn't be any worse than things are now. <laughs> and this is more or less true. We are in the hell we've made for ourselves. And we can transform it into something better simply by using the power within ourselves constructively. Realizing that the energy which enables us to walk and talk and think, that this energy is a divine force it's not something that was worked out in a laboratory. It is part of the infinite life of things. It is shared by every creature that man has imagined or seen. Therefore, having this tremendous potential, we also have the responsibility for use. And we go back through history. And some people don't believe in checking history. It's a little discouraging. But actually, as Lord Bacon observed, uh, history is very helpful, for history finally shows us that that which is wrong cannot survive. History can prove to us definitely that the mysterious twilight of the gods ends the corruptions of mankind, that things that are done wrong destroy themselves. One by one great powers have risen, become avaricious and ambitious, covered the world with blood and misery, and then disappeared in a terrific orgy of pain and decline. Actually, 
history has proven conclusively that fallacy has never succeeded. Dishonesty has never been proven to be truly useful. Everything that is wrong is something for the moment, an appetite to be gratified and to end in suffering later. But we've got a nice enough world now, but there's another factor coming in that makes Paul's ideas rather important. Populations seemingly are going to continue to increase. Well, this is very serious to people who feel that it's going to uh, limit their ability to succeed. Uh, under an increasing population, perhaps we can't all have everything we want. Perhaps we can't all have expensive estates and uh, expensive vacations. Supposing we move this present population up to 10 billion people. Uh, is that going to mean that there'll be no food for us? Are we going to gradually starve ourselves to death? No, I don't think so. It's part, this birth rate increase and the consequences are part of natural law. They are part of the plan that is being used to correct us. We are going to be shown definitely that we cannot be selfish in a world in which selfishness is fatal. And we might as well learn it now as we can learn it later. But we're going to find that little by little things get tougher. The individual is going to get more thoughtful. Little by little we will reorganize our society, removing from it the dangers uh, which could result from overpopulation. There is no reason why this earth cannot support twice our present population with ease. If a few people were not so selfish that they have refused to share the good life with others who are just as deserving as they are. So by degrees, the great truths of life, which we find in the scriptures of the world, come home to us in our own daily provocations. They come to us in the things that we do, and the things that we see, and the things that we hear around us. And uh, this is one way in which I think the Western branch of Christianity, the Latin Christianity, or the, and the Greek also, as far as that's concerned, are going to be very valuable. We have already seen that the temporal power of great religious organizations is waning. Uh, it is impossible for them to remain unchanging in a world of constant change. So we hear people saying more and more, we've got to be more progressive in our religions. We've got to stop sticking to the old ideas and allow new and better things to come in. We cannot remain static in a dynamic universe, which we are trying to do. Well, that applies also to every institution that we have, whether it is business or agriculture or science. Everything that we do and everything that we have must adjust to a new way of life or it cannot survive. And when it adjusts to this new way of life, believe it or not, the adjustment will be in the direction of basic Christianity. It will be the idea of the gradual victory of kindness over hate, the final victory of giving over taking, and the final victory of personal ambition in the presence of common need. All these things are part of a divine plan. And though we are in a very faulty educational system, we are also forever in the school of the Holy Ghost. We can never get out of it. For life is always going to be the great instructor. And when life goes sour and crime increases and delinquency dominates the social patterns, then, as Krishna says in India, then I come forth. And in these moments of emergency, the individual starts to think. He starts to wonder and he starts to believe. And he starts to question the thing as it is and how it could be better. And in that moment, the God in us comes forth. Because it has been called by a just and proper need. So we are going to go past this period of great wealth and great nations and great political parties and come finally to the simple fact that we are brothers in one world 
that we are part of one creation, that we are one of countless creations in space, but that all together we are ruled by one law, one power, one eternal dispensation, one beginning that has no end, and that law manifests in every level as integrity and honesty and love. When we realize these things a little more clearly, we'll get out of our present doldrums that we've been worrying so much about. Now, there are new people coming in all the time with new plans and new programs, but these are not going to work unless these people do not continue to perpetuate the profit system in their own thinking. Actually, we should not be allowing profit to control religious progress. We should not be trying to get rich off of faith. But we are not dealing with the same coin or in the same realm. What we must now do is realize that the greatest blessing of all, the blessing of life, is free. We can't buy it, we can't sell it, but we can destroy it in ourselves or release it forever from our own physical existence. In the Orient, the human body is re realized or recognized as a world. I remember when I was in Baroda, the museum there, I saw a diagram on which several generations of artists have been picturing the anatomy of the human body. Uh, being inexperienced and rather young at the time, I thought I might be able to talk the museum out of that picture, but I wasn't entirely successful. I might have been able to have gotten somewhere if I had been able to stay a long time, at least been able to get a copy made. But anyway, the picture was a great cross-section of the human body. It was about 12 feet high, the picture, and probably five or six feet wide. And it showed the entire system of artery, nerves, and veins. And on every nerve, vein, and artery was the figure of a deity. They were not any more little drops of blood or something. They were gods. Even the little veins in our bodies, the cells, are divine. They have, each of them, a power that the greatest scientist has not been able to discover. We cannot know how any of this comes into being. It is something that is born in a mystery, like ourselves. Even sometimes in these very tiny forms of life, so mysterious even a microscope will reveal very little. But this life goes on, and this life means that every part of us is alive, every organ is alive. There are whole races and empires and nationalities within the flesh of each of us, and everything depends upon the maintenance of the equilibrium and balance of this vast population of minute particles. We have to keep them in order. We have to take proper care of them. We have to nourish them. We have to protect them from the abuses of our minds and emotions. Or we will end in great sickness. So all we do is project this same thought out into society. The whole world, is from the minerals on upward to the invisible gases and energies, are living things to be used. And if properly used, they help to build the purpose for, what they, for which they were intended, the advancement of the cosmos, the final liberation of all that lives, the return of the part to the entire, or as Pythagoras would call it, the restoration of unity as the supreme principle of existence. Unity, of course, is oneness, fraternity, uh, happiness, peace, justice. These things are of the greatest essential meaning to us all. So it's coming a little at the time. Day by day we see more of it. We notice a gradual but very systematic change in the lives of many, many people. For the first time, certainly in my generation and on, we see people really hungry for a better understanding of life. And when I started out, very few people really cared. It was only a few in very deep trouble who could be considered likely to improve themselves. Now everyone, because of the inconsistencies and insecurities we have created for ourselves, 
is seeking for an answer. And as we look for an answer to the capitalistic problem or to the employment, let us remember that we are also looking for a question for amnesia or for epilepsy or for diabetes. We are looking for solutions to these things. And that which might be a misuse of business energies on one level might have to do with the various functions of a gland or something within our bodies. Everything is looking for help. But all help comes from essentially the gradual correction of the mistakes of living. And we all have to come to it finally. And we all have to realize that we don't going to be perfect. We're not going to do it all in a moment. We're not going to overcome all our weaknesses in a day. But we must be moving slowly toward the goals we seek. And nature says if we are moving in the right direction, it will give us plenty of time to finish. We will be able to do anything ultimately that we will to do if it is right. And while we may not accomplish it all in this life, we will have opportunities to be all we dream of being if, well, it's the, if the dream is true. But if the dream is merely a selfish effort to get something we want, then we are in trouble. As we look around us today, and read, you can read the uh, various writings of Paul and see some of the truths that he so clearly sets forth. And he tells us that we now look through a glass darkly, but someday we will look face to face. We are all looking through glasses darkly now, but someday we will face to face. And that statement probably indicates that Paul was an initiate of one of the esoteric orders of the Near East. That his conversion probably was something in which he was divinely appointed to do what was necessary at that time and was probably uniquely qualified to do it. But he says definitely that the, uh, there was a certain power behind him uh, that he would truly we would see face to face. Now the lower degrees of the Eleusinian mysteries uh, were called the veiled. There was a veil over the altar and we saw through a veil in the lesser degrees the great Eleusinian mysteries of Greece. When this high degree, uh, the second and advanced degree of the initiation rite was at attained, the veil was removed. In the rites of Isis and Osiris, the veil covered Isis through the lesser rites. And when the greater initiations were given, the veil was lifted. In the great initiation of life, when we deserve it, the veil is lifted. And now we live on one side of a veil. And as we live on that one side of the veil, we can remember the words of Sir Edwin Arnold. Veil upon veil we lift, but find veil upon veil behind. The mystery of life is very marvelous and very complicated, but we all live behind or outside of a veil, which will be lifted as we gradually release the integrities within ourselves. We will face the truth when we are strong enough to bear it. We will not face it while we can destroy it. And if the knowledge is something that we intend to pervert, it will never be given to us. The secrets of life will never be revealed in their fullness and completeness as long as anyone lives, lives or exists who would want to use the secrets of life to destroy life. All these things are carefully controlled and each individual has a restraint not upon himself. He can do as he will to do but upon the consequences of his own action. He will be taught ultimately that he will be rewarded when he overcomes and outgrows the problems that we face today. We have an election year coming up and we don't know who to elect. We have to look around and if somebody is exposing or dis describing or dis disengaging us from something or someone. We live in a mass of confusion here we are in a civilization that has grown up for thousands of years and is still in complete confusion. And that confusion becomes 
more difficult, the more educated we become. The more we know of science and art and literature and physics and biology and chemistry, the more trouble we're in. Because we use all these things for purposes of selfishness and, com and competition. We do all kinds of things personally for the same motive. We take on all kinds of jobs simply for profit and we're not with any regard for the value of the products. So all this has to change and if it changes we're going to find that there will be for each of us in due time and in proper measure and proper order an Easter. We're going to have the resurrection of the spirit. It's coming. In fact, lots of spirits have gotten pretty much re resurrected even now. They're coming every day. More and more people are beginning to understand the meaning of education. Education has given us to know how to live. Wisdom has given us in order that we may think through the problems of our own lives. Our senses are given to us so that we can observe the virtues and vices of those around us, can see what is happening and judge accordingly. Everywhere, therefore, there is a, an opening up, there is a big increasing, there is a greater becoming of hope. And we are told definitely that within the next 20 years, there will be very major changes and they are being prophesied everywhere by a great many different people. And they seem to be coming from some subconscious source within ourselves. And when the inner life of the individual says Pro progress is coming, it will come. If the individual is simply waiting for a new legislation to cure a mistake in policy, nothing will come. But when we are ready to face into the facts and reconstruct a civilization so that it can endure, it will endure and will be the first to have endurance, for everything has finally fallen from the weaknesses within itself. And there's no need for this to go on in this way any longer. So Easter it will always be a very important day, for it always will stand either for the resurrection of truth in principle, or resurrection of truth in ourselves. And when it is, comes in ourselves, we're all going to be a very great deal happier than we are now. We will realize the real meaning of Easter. The great problems of uh, Easter have to do also with the uh, vernal equinox. The vernal equinox to the ancients was the eternal rebirth of the sun. The vernal equinox was the promise of another year of opportunity. The, uh, the ancients worshipped life itself at the vernal equinox, thanking the heavens and the gods and all the powers for the promise of another year. We are being given another year. Here we stand on the threshold of it. For the year of, the, of, the na of nature be and of life begins at Christmas, but the year of the soul begins at Easter, for it is the beginning of enlightenment. It is the beginning of a new world order. Each year we bring the wisdom of the past to bear upon the needs of the future. And this year we have wisdom to bring forth and we have a future in need of wisdom. We have an opportunity to contribute to the annual birth of good. And each year at the vernal equinox, truth and reality are re-embodied for our benefit. This is an old symbolism, but it is a very nice one. And whether it is literally true or not is of no difference. Because things spiritually and true within the inner life of the individual may often be in conflict with what we call the truths of mundane existence. Actually, every year is an open gate to a better life. The mistakes we have made, we have made. We can regret them, we can remedy them the best we can. But each year is an opportunity for new effort new achievement, new accomplishment, new dedications, and we can live each year a little better than the one before. And by so doing, on the next year that comes around, we will be still a little better to face it. This is the ancient belief that the vernal equinox is given by God as a new opportunity
for human beings to grow, to become greater in truth, greater in beauty, greater in wisdom. And if we take advantage of that, we will in due time appreciate all this that is happening for us. We will suddenly realize truly that we are in a universe in which a great reality is determined or by nature must inevitably bring all creatures to perfection. Nothing is lost. The only waste is the time that we lose which we might be using for something of permanent value. Let us try to educate ourselves for the future. Let us try to find real happiness in things that we do and in the simple problems of daily life. Let us try to find friendship. Let us also look deeply within ourselves and prayerfully and in meditation see if we can find the spirit of the innermost, that which is forever there waiting for us to allow it to take control and command of our daily existence. If we can make some of these little thoughts and ideals and dedications, we will find that Easter has greater and more enduring meaning for us all. Well, I think that's it for this morning. I'd just like to announce that a week from tomorrow, here we're going to have a meeting upstairs, I believe, of the Veritat Foundation. And on that occasion, my wife is going to uh, give a discussion and we're going to have a, we're going to have a workshop. So if those of you who are interested, uh, we cordially invite you to be present for that occasion. Thank you all and have a wonderful Easter and may the blessings of the year be upon you each and every one. Thank you.